Hey everyone and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast where we seek to develop, inspire and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now here's what we've got for you today. My guest on the podcast today is Dan Stevens. Dan currently serves as the Chief Fire and Rescue Advisor and Inspector at the Welsh Government. Dan's a highly experienced and operationally competent Chief Fire Officer and Chief Executive Officer. Prior to his current role as a Chief Officer at Melbourne Metropolitan Fire Brigade, having previously served seven years as the Chief Fire Officer at Merseyside Fire and Rescue. His time during Merseyside had some of the most significant challenges in the history of the organisation, maintaining excellent levels of performance throughout. Dan has extensive operational leadership experience around critical incident decision making, having been the fire and rescue incident manager at a number of major incidents. He was the National Fire Chief's Chair for Operational Coordination Committee and the Strategic Lead Officer for National Resilience and Capability Lead Officer for Urban Search and Rescue and the UK International Search and Rescue Teams. He was awarded the Queen's Fire Service Medal in the Queen's New Year's Honours in 2015. And prior to joining the Fire and Rescue Service, he was a soldier in the 3rd Battalion Parachute Regiment, from which he was discharged with the exemplary service record. Today in our conversation, we cover a massive landscape of stuff. This is definitely something you're going to want to come back to. We go into the origin of national operational guidance and talk about national incident data and some of the correlating trends that we see through IRS. We cast our minds back to the integration and early stages of the Swedish firefighting method. We look at CFPTI, anti-ventilation and studies on heat release rates. We ask ourselves the question, have we forgotten the original teachings of James Braidwood and how much of that still exists in the fire service today? We also tip the hat to Rosander and Gisselson's work and take a brief look inside the personal cost that comes with senior leadership. Dan also shares some real knowledge bombs in terms of leadership lessons and the long screwdriver, how to avoid being that yourself and how the leadership role is to state the destination, but not to tell you the journey. There is a lot in today's episode that I think you're going to want to come back to. Dan is going to be joining us again for a follow-up episode at some point in time. It really was an absolute pleasure to have Dan on the podcast and I really hope you enjoyed today's episode. So UK firefighting guidance underwent a complete transformation between 1994 and 1997. Following a program of research aimed at reducing the financial losses from large fires, UK fire service guidance began advocating an American-style ventilation strategy combined with a Swedish-style suppression strategy. However, neither was fully embedded and implemented within the UK Fire and Rescue Service and in our environment, and none of them fully suited what we were doing. So the two approaches had not been designed to work together because US ventilation theories were not based on scientific evidence. Both the US and Sweden have moved on in many ways, and they issued some new stuff in the 1990s, while the UK, we did not embed all this. So since 1995, the rate of firefighting fatalities per building fire in the UK has almost doubled. National Operational Guidance, Fires and Firefighting 2016 is the current UK firefighting guidance. So the reason I wanted to start with this, Dan, is because you did a big piece of work uh, with NOG. You worked very closely with it. And, you know, before we came on and recorded today, you seem to have a real passion around doctoring, training were taught, our entrenched beliefs. Some of these, a lot of these not always being based on the available science. Give me an understanding of kind of your background and, and why you're so passionate about this. Okay, Pete. So prior to my leaving Merseyside as the chief officer to go over to Melbourne to take off the the chief chief exec position over there. I was uh, one of my national roles was the NFCC chair of the operations coordination committee. Now that I, I believe it's the operational Resil- uh, preparedness, resilience, and response committee now, but but back then that's mm-hmm. that's what it was called. And one of the the areas that uh, that the areas of corporate responsibility that I oversaw on behalf of the. The National Fire Chiefs Council was National Operational Guidance. Mm-hmm. Now, back in the day, the the through the the auspices of what was the the Operations Committee that was formerly chaired by Roy Wiltshire prior to me taking it over when Roy became I saw the chair Roy of the again National recently. Fire Chief. I saw him at the AFSA conference. Roy's still knocking about. Bless him. He's a funny old character. I like Roy. He's very stern though. <laughs> He's, uh, Roy is a, a solid citizen, Peter. Roy is, um, so he's in His Majesty's... Um, Inspector at still, yeah. He's doing police and crime stuff as well now, isn't he? He's doing all of it, yeah. 
Well, part of the, 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 the difference, if you like, between the role that Roy has in, in England and the role that I have in Wales, for all intents and purposes, the fire aspects are the same. But my mm-hmm. role does not extend to policing, whereas in England, as you say, it's it's uh, HMIC, FRS, is the, the, the police service and the, the fire yes, rescue sir. service. Hence, Roy's, Roy's scope is, is, is far broader than that, which... which mm-hmm which I cover. So, but to, to, to go back to the, um, if you look at the origins of, the, of national operational guidance, it sort of dates back to around, I'm going to say 2014. You have to forgive me, Pete, my mm-hmm. memory isn't what it once was, but I'm, I'm going no, to say it would, it would have been around that time. So back in the day, the HMI for fire, when fire was under the home office, and then I, I guess more latterly, it would have been, ODPM, DCLG, and all the various different iterations thereafter. So pr- prior to it coming back into the Home Office around 2016, the responsibility for the production of guidance rested with the HMI. So that would be the old, the legacy, the red books, the manuals of firemanship, as they were called back in the day. I've got, I've got one of them old here from 1985. Uh, I've got the uh, drill service, the fire service drill book next to my laptop now. The drill book, now known as the Fire and Rescue Service Training and Development Manual. And if, if you need me to, I can probably quote all of the individual standard practice <laughs> drills and techniques. But uh, we'll make more than more to that later. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress, and we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative waterproof breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide gore-tex going further together the hmi had responsibility for the production of, of our national guidance so the, essentially was the the manuals of firemanship more latterly became fire service manuals with different volumes Mm-hmm. And we'll maybe speak about a, a little bit about some of that a little later. But mm-hmm. the, that then, the responsibility with, with the, with, if you like, with the removal of the HMI in England, there was the introduction then of the Chief Fire and Rescue Advisor. The first Chief Fire and Rescue Advisor was was Sir Ken Knight, and then mm-hmm. right after it was it was it was Peter Holland, one of my former colleagues from the from the Northwest, and the Chief Fire and Rescue Advisors Unit then took on responsibility for. The production of, of guidance, yeah. and one of the uh, one of the products that they uh, that they delivered or that they they inherited and oversaw was the generic risk assessments, the GRAs. It is probably fair to say that the the, the chief fire and rescue advisors unit was probably not as well funded as the HMI, well established or funded as the as the HMI was, and, and therefore it, yeah. it, it's fair to say it became increasingly more challenging for. Yeah. For Peter, as was Peter Holland, to 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 maintain the guidance, and that was something that was was recognised throughout the sector, and that, mm-hmm. along with a a, a sort of a, a shift in thinking around the, the sector taking more professional ownership, professional responsibility, is ultimately what was Chief Fire Officers Association then became National Fire Chiefs Council. That transition. Part of that was was the creation of national operational guidance and the the, the, the NOG program through what is now the, the central program office, and that would never have happened if that were not for the support of Ron Dobson, the the Commissioner of London at the time, and London funded that to the tune of uh, I'm going to say it was around three million pounds to get that to get that started. Wow! So the likes of myself, Roy Wiltshire, uh, Ron clearly, and, and others, we were very much instrumental in the in, in the, the progression of the development of NOG from the from the get-go. Yeah. Essentially what NOG is, if you if, if you in, in the most simple terms, it is hazard and risk control statements, which essentially was what the GRAs are. Mm-hmm. And they are written in order to allow for policy writers at the local level 
to then produce their own what should be a, 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 a standardised doctrine based on fairly generic hazards and control, yeah. hazard knowledge, control measure knowledge. Yeah. And then gives them freedom for the tactical deployment of that through their available resources, because that's the unique aspect, isn't it? The Lowell Fire and Rescue Services have different assets, different budgets, different equipment that they've purchased, and the, the geographical challenges are obviously very different as well. Completely, Pete, completely. So there was, you know, as, as a chief officer heavily involved in ops back in the day, you know, there was a, in the Northwest, for example, we produced standard operational procedures aligned to the, the GRA index. And I think there was a view among some of my colleagues or, or, or a wish that you know, probably for some of the, 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 the services that were maybe less well resourced, essentially asking, can you write our SOP? You know, can you not write national SOPs? Yeah. My response to that always was, <clears throat> if we... Put aside the terminology of standard operational procedure for a second. And if we just indulge me and in, substitute that for operational risk assessment, mm -hmm. then the hazard knowledge and the control measure knowledge for all the reasonably foreseeable incident types is should be based on evidence, science, you know, research, should mm -hmm. be fairly standard, should be well accepted. And theoretically, at least, you should be able to produce a national or indeed international slash worldwide basis, a set of generic operational risk assessments in the fire and rescue space. And I say that, you know, I've had experience in Australia. Let, let me tell you, Pete, the fires in Australia behaved exactly the same way as the fires do here. And the American research, Dutch research, shows that the fires in America and in the Netherlands behave exactly the same as well because they're governed by science and we really shouldn't be surprised by that so yes but that sorry there's a, there's a very difficult link you've just jumped to chasm i feel and i'd be remiss if i didn't uh challenge on behalf of the listener and myself as well based on science they behave the same but with an absence of uh deep understanding or at least a visceral understanding of the science behind fire as one example of, of the operations of the fire and rescue service buildings an example buildings are all constructed very differently different materials across the world so when we say building fire and this is just one very small example they won't they'll behave the same based on the science of how fire behaves but as you look at it zoom out and look at it as the building on fire and the ventilation profile the size of compartments and all that sort of stuff and please tell me if i'm talking out of my ass because of course i'm stuck inside my own internal bias from my own teachings and experiences they don't behave the same when you layer it with all of those aspects or am i completely wrong there so i, I think can we hold that thought, Pete? Can we come back? Yes, to that? I'll stick a pin in that and then circle we just, back. If we just finish the going yes, back please, to the, the, the generic hazards, hazard knowledge, control measure knowledge, being the same the world over. And we will definitely come back to your point because it's a really good point, and I, I really do want to come back to that. What I would say is I believe that you could produce again on a generic basis a menu of tactical options or control measure tactics, if, which is the terminology that I prefer to use, certainly when developing the, the, the MESI side standard operational procedures, which, which essentially were predicated on this, this operational risk assessment, hazard knowledge, control measure knowledge, control measure tactics. So that menu of tactical options, which in of itself is... is in the end would be finite there would be a finite number of tactical options depending on the level at which the, the, the detail the granularity you wanted to go to so for example offensive exterior attack generic term for straight stream steep angle through a, a window an exterior mm. window right the way through to high pressure misting system it's mm -hmm. essentially it's an offensive exterior attack, but 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 it's a, yes. it's an arguably different tactic. You take the point. You could produce that menu of tactical options, which then the local policy writer, absolutely as you said, can then select from those tactical options 
based on the local resource, the, 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 yeah. all of the factors that you talked about. And that, for me, is, is in, in, in this space, that's probably the holy grail in respect of standardisation and okay. the, the, the achievement of, of consistency, intraoperability, service to service, and, and, and so forth. And that was certainly always, I guess, what I was trying to... That's what I've always advocated and, and, and what it is that I've always tried to, to achieve. And, and ultimately, that would be determined through the the services strategic risk assessment that looks strategically at the threats, hazard and risks and insofar as they apply to the the, the, the the operational territorial area of responsibility. And then those overlays around, is it rural, urban, combination of both? What does the resource and look like and so forth? Hmm. But coming back to the fundamental point is, yes, that's the holy grail, but that only works if the doctrine is sound, if it's based on correct, correct, you know, accurate, scientifically proven research. Coming back to the point that you raised there, in respect of the the different building constructions and and, and so forth, and mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. And the example I can use for you is, is the difference between Australian con uh, construction and UK. So the house I live in in the UK is a brick-built internal brick partition. Essentially, it's a brick box with little brick boxes inside it. Essentially, yes. that's what it is. Much the same as many other UK houses. So the 1950s, semi-detached property, the same as you'll find in, in across the UK, yes. built around that area. The house we had in Australia was a single story brick outer skin but essentially stud stud wall stud partition interior yeah okay so fundamentally different in in, in that respect okay. it was still partitioned it was compartmented in the way in which i've described mm -hmm. it was fundamentally different let me tell you where the similarities start and this is the point of importance in, in, in my view in both properties, they were furnished. The building contents were relatively modern contemporary. So not legacy building materials. These are modern synthetic-based materials, which have probably four times the heat release rate of their legacy alternatives. Now let's hold that thought, because that's important. Mm. But yeah. still, in my mind, I'm still thinking... If we're looking at the metric of confining fires to room of origin, and I will talk about why I think there are some limitations to that, or at least the way in which that's expressed within the incident recording system. My first thought was, if I analyse the data there, I'm almost certain that they're going to see more fires going beyond the room of origin, because in, and my, my instinct is thinking, because... My brick compartment here is going to contain a fire more so than the stud partition yeah. compartment. Much higher thermal capacity for the boundaries. Oh, so, yeah, it's going to hold that. it for longer. All of that. And actually, when you look at the American research, not the similar construction, actually, in some respects to the Australian construction, climatic reasons predominantly. Mm -hmm. We compare it with the Dutch research, which is much closer to ours, which is why I like to use the two of them as the relative comparisons. Big differences in building construction, similarities in content. And actually, when it comes down to it, you think about your any fire investigation you will have done. Much hinges on item first ignited and then orientation of fuel within the compartment as to mm -hmm. oven your fire spread. And if we accept that typically a modern, let's say a sofa for a, a living room fire or a, a, a bed for a mattress then for a, for a bedroom fire, three piece, say three piece suite, double mattress, both of which probably capable of generating a five megawatt fire, more than enough to transition the compartment to flash over. Absolutely. But what we mm -hmm. see is when you look at the, 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 the experimentation 
say, either in America or, or in uh, or, or, or the Dutch, you're going to get from ignition, from point of ignition. Of course, it all this all assumes that that's the item first ignited, or at the very least, the item first ignited then spreads to the higher heat release rate. Yeah. Because I've got some stuff I can hit yeah. you with in a minute, which which will back this up. Then, theoretically, at least, but like the the the, the archetypical Christmas tree video, you're going to see that room transition to flash over in three three or four minutes tops. Yeah. Other than, of course, the one factor which, based on science, is irrefutable. If you looked at a graph, and actually even in the, the, the fires in buildings extant nod, this graph actually exists. And I, I, I really what I should have done is teed it up so I could load it up now and talk out talk the viewers through it. But essentially on the left hand axis you've got heat release rate. The bottom axis is time. And what you see is from ignition, very rapid heat release rate. Hmm. Probably after two to three minutes, if we had a right-hand accent uh, axis that showed oxygen concentration, you'd go from 21%, which this is a scientific fact, Pete. I'm sat in a whittle. You're clearly somewhere else in Northern England. But the oxygen, con uh, the, the oxygen concentration in either room we're sat in is 21%. That is a scientific yeah. fact. As it is, wherever your viewers are sat, that's just a fact. As if it isn't, they, they need to get because they're in trouble if it is. <laughs> if their house is on fire and they got a carbon monoxide. Yeah. Put that aside. Right? Whether I'm sat in Australia, America, wherever, that's 21%. Other than when you get that ignition, as the heat release rate goes up, if on the right hand side of the axis there was oxygen concentration, that starts to go down. And once that hits 16%, it is a scientific fact that combustion can no longer be sustained. The yeah. fire goes into decay. That yeah. is a fact. And what the Americans have shown is, irrespective of whether that's in an open plan, it, it may there may be more available oxygen, but probably even and even if there is a localized flash over, it still isn't enough to sustain what would then be a full room involvement of the, the ULFSRI on their firefighter safety training pool where they, they look at the study where they do the, the same experiments in a strip mount. So a commercial premise. Fire. Looking at this one here, boss. So essentially, yeah, is... that's that's exactly what we're at there. So yeah. if you look at the... We'll make this document available to people in the links so they can reference what we're talking about. Yeah, you, 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 essentially, if, if on the right-hand axis it showed oxygen concentration, you would see 21% mm -hmm. dropping down to the mm -hmm. troughs would be around 16%. Mm -hmm. And actually what you see is typically where it starts to rise again is fire yeah. and rescue service intervention. Yes. And I can, what I can give you here is some acute examples and, and 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 i'll do it pete i will do it for a fact but let me say before mm -hmm. the do in no way is this intended as a criticism of any of the people involved here no it's no no of course we're doing the best with the knowledge that we have none of this is out of malice or stupidity it's the way we've been taught indeed which dates back to two surveys from 1994 which I'll, i will reference in other news, this episode is brought to you in partnership with MSA Safety. Today, we have them to thank for the improved firefighter safety through connectivity in their brand new connected firefighter system. At the center of the connected firefighter platform is the MSA M1 SCBA with telemetry. You can view battery life, air pressure, and estimated time remaining either independently on the M1 itself or from the lunar connected device screen. Also, still with the air status alarm information, search status, and all of this provided to the incident command for confident decision making during the scene. That integrates straight in with the lunar system, which is a wireless all in one device creating an independent search and rescue network, providing edge detection, enhanced personal thermal imaging, while simplifying post scene reporting and data retention. One of the key parts of the lunar is their fast system, the firefighting assisting search technology. This combines directional and distance information 
with thermal imaging to help find separated teammates and decrease response time. It actually connects you to the other crews in the vicinity for a unified search during the time of mutual aid by instantly notifying the network of lunar devices when there is a downed crew member, allowing for a prompt search and rescue. All of this then plugs into the Biogrid system for cloud-based connectivity, real-time information, and data-driven decisions for the incident commander. It enables you to see the exact location of your firefighters on the scene. And it doesn't require you to be sat on the station. The MSA hub then provides a wireless gateway straight to the cloud, enabling wireless on-scene data for local and remote incident command for additional eyes on the scene. MSA are truly taking massive strides in the future of improved firefighter safety through connectivity. MSA is dedicated to increasing safety in the fire service through technological advancements. Various feature enhancements, new products, partnerships and integrations will provide additional capabilities readily accessible by products, software and services in the brand new MSA Connected Firefighter platform. Now back to the show. Essentially, if you take, let's take Shirley Towers as an example. Mm -hmm. So B18 Red 1 go in. As I understand it, Red 2 is tasked as a hose management team going in behind them. So they're going in with a, what I understand to be a 45 mil from what I would guess was a 100 mil dry riser. So charged, you would think 10 bar, so a 45, a line of 45, charged the 10, ninth floor, working out your pressure and flow. I'm guessing, depending on the flow setting on the branch, it would be reasonable to assume you get a flow rate of at least 300 litres a minute out of that, you would think, at least. The 18 red one goes in, the flat nine. I assume that the door has left the jar here. But what I think it's fair to say is because they cannot locate understandably cannot locate the fire in the living room because it's ventilation controlled at that point so mm -hmm. you'd be giving off large volumes of smoke visibility will be next to zero all completely understandable they are unable to locate the fire they go upstairs then this is an up flat so they're going in mm -hmm. on floor nine they then go up to the 10th floor which is the bedrooms again they cannot locate a fire in any of the bedrooms hmm. and then what happens they then it, it, and again it's all a matter of this is a matter of record they then open the windows because in their minds they think we're going to ventilate it will improve the conditions yeah. now go back to the fire in the in which the fire has established beyond reasonable doubt no one's disputing the fire is in the living room so on your diagram there, you can see that it's, and they are now up on the, what is now the 10th floor, because the, the upper box, that's the fire escape on the 11th floor, which the, which being team red one gets on top. So by opening the windows, what they've then done, assuming we've got the front door is open, they have then introduced oxygen into that fire. They have created a flow path. It is a scientific fact that high pressure goes to low pressure, that hot goes to cold. The hot fire gases from that now rapidly developing fire, which has now got all this ad additional oxygen, and all of the research shows that a ventilation control fire in decay can rapidly transition to flashover conditions, unsurvivable heat flux conditions within a minute, two minutes. That is then what is happening. They are in the exhaust. They are the wrong side of the of, of the. They're in the exhaust vent. So B eighteen red one and red two. Red one managed to get out of the eleventh floor. Red two do not. Tragically, firefighters Bannon and Shears, they do not manage to get out. Right, this is a fact. This is not a criticism. It's not. That's a fact. What happens thereafter is when it is established that the the B eighteen red two are unaccounted for. And again, this is all there in the report, not me making any of this up. What then happens is subsequent teams go in and they are quoted as pulsing for the best part of 20 minutes and having no effect whatsoever on them what is a post splash over fire. So that, whether you're in Australia, whether you're in America, Southampton, wherever you are, doesn't really matter that much about the construction because unless every door and window is open in that house 
that fire is going to become venting. Any fire that has the potential to go beyond the room of origin, the reasonable assumption to make is it's going to become ventilation controlled or limited, probably within two or three minutes. Hence, the Dutch principles, the renewed view of firefighting, first principle, you've got more time than you think. And maybe we come back to some of that. If I can, if, if you'll indulge me, if I just speak to two, two sort of fundamentals here, that, 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 and you referenced them at the beginning, and, and unfortunately, as yet, they are still not, in my view at least, appropriately addressed within fires and firefighting, which was out for consultation last year. I and others made fairly extensive submissions, evidence-based submissions, and I, I, my hope is that they will be taken into account and when the final version is published, which will be split into a foundation for firefighting and then the, the firefight non hazard and risk control statements. My hope is then that ambiguity is removed, science-based evidence is in there, and it, and it should begin a, a shift in thinking. If I can, you just indulge me, just look at two two specific issues that, that to consider here, both of which date back to the research. FRDG report, thing 494 and 594, survey of backdraft, survey of ventilation. So we'll look at the survey of backdraft first. It was a guy called Chitty, commissioned by the Home Office Fire Research Development Group, which clearly no longer exists because we don't have anything like that anymore. So Chitty goes over to Sweden to have a look at what was the Matrasander Krista Gisselson method, like the system that, that Rosander and Gisselson had developed. And that system essentially was predicated on the, it, yes, very much gas cooling, but, but you've got to look at the system in a whole. So some fundamentals, it was a three-person team. Third firefighter, the team leader responsible for door control, anti-ventilation, closing down the flow path. Clearly, you can't shut the door completely because you've got a hose line running through it. The hose line was 38 millimetre, low pressure, high flow. We designed a branch specifically to deliver the, the, I think, the 0.3 mil droplet. So the optimum pulse droplet size, no problem at all with that. Only ever designed for use in small compartments. And probably the fundamental piece of this is used to progress through the small compartment with door control, thus keeping the fire relatively ventilation controlled and heat release rate relatively low. But once they got in line of sight of that compartment, they switched to straight stream, they put the fire out. That bit, of course, gets lost. The only bit of that that, we, that that finds its way over here is the pulsing bit. Not with 48 mm. mil or 45 or 52 mil. Predominantly with 19 mil hose reels capable yep. of flowing 100 litres a minute at best on a straight stream. Yep. So th this all gets lost in translation. You then compound that with the the tack vent, and, and listen, Pete, I, I, you, you, you could, no one could have been more immersed than me in this stuff. You know, I, I did my station officer's exam in 97. So I did my LFs, my subs, my stale. Back in the day, we still had the IFE. And, of course, the, yeah. the first iterations of compartment fires and tack vent, they'd come out, and they actually made their way onto the syllabus. I was all over that stuff. But equally, I knew yeah, it. that's a whole a whole other conversation. I'll circle back to in a minute the what's happening with IFE and the foundational knowledge of officers now, especially when we look at things like direct entry and things like that, which is another rabbit hole. Maybe we'll make time for in a bit. But you know, I come back to this stuff's fundamental. Now, yeah. at least, I, and, and I'm not saying the the, the 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 exams were imperfect to a put as where the you know the the. The yeah. Fire Service College Foundation, you know, JOA, you know, or Crew Command, Watch Command 1, 2, whatever they call them these days, essentially were based on the they, they were based on the, the manuals. But it was good stuff. It was based on science. It was based on, to be honest, James Braidwood's essays in the in the eighteen hundreds. You know, Braidwood, yeah. the fire grows in direct proportion to the oxygen supplied to it. I I would tend to be minded to listen to what Braidwood had to say, given the fact that back then they had no BA. 
he didn't have any pumps in the way or, or any firefighting media around the way we did. So the sort of stuff they were doing, that was by doing the hard yards and the lived experience. I'd be minded to listen to what the, the likes of him uh, that, that they had to say. And of course, yeah. our guidances were leading up until we adopt or make a, a, a partial adoption at best of Rosander and Gisselson's work, which I've got no problem with, by the way. Absolutely fine, provided yeah. you do exactly what it was that they were that, that they were advocating, which clearly were not doing. You know, and similarly, we're using demonstration units, you know, as attack boxes. And I'll come on to the fuel loads in a sec, but just turning to the ventilation. Back in the 90s, you know, the Americans vent off and, you know, vent early, vent off them. Okay, which is what they did. Yeah. Vertical ventilation predominantly, not horizontal, vertical. So they'd have an engine company, you've got a ladder company. Engine company does the fire attack, ladder company gets up on the roof, opens it up. Okay, get that, get the principle of it. A couple of points to consider. A, the resource that way, and they're probably getting there quite quickly and they're getting there together. The other fundamental is in America, much newer country than here, their water main, essentially, the domestic supply is drawn off the fire main. They've probably got 300 mil mains, you know, it's, it's they're like trunk mains everywhere. We're lucky here, 100 mil main. We're drawing the fire attack off the domestic supply, you know, and you'll have had yeah. issues with walls at the same. Compound that, we're going in with the 19 mil hose reel, capable of flowing 100 litres tops on a straight street. Versus the Yanks, you know, one and three quarter inch smooth ball, yeah. you know, with a flow and probably five and five. On it. Yeah. Very, very different set of circles. But don't get me wrong, if they're getting it wrong, they're still killing people. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm not advocating vertical ventilation, don't get me wrong. I'm with Braidwood, I'm advocating anti ventilation, I'm advocating shut mm-hmm. the windows, shut the door, you know, don't do, shut it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because here's the thing. The and I think certainly for the contextual understanding for people newer into the fire service, that is the point I would like to highlight and zoom in on. Because of the advances in compartmentation in buildings, there's a much greater argument and understanding for anti-ventilation because the buildings can take it a lot of the time. Places like Grenfell and others, exemptions, because there's only so much we can encompass within this sheep dip analogy but the principle of anti-ventilation is uh, very sparsely shared, I think. And that's the point. You you touched on it earlier. We have a generation, maybe two generations now, of, of, of supervisory managers, through no fault of their own, hmm. probably have nothing like the depth of understanding of fire behaviour. Mm-hmm. And they're still relying on, you know, fires and firefighting is the extant version, not helped by the fact you've got fires in buildings which sit separate to it. There's, there are scientific inaccuracies in there, that, that it is contradictory. It, you know, it, it's written with the best of intentions. The people who wrote that wrote it based on uh, compartment fires attack vent, which in of itself... Back then, particularly, was advocating American style ventilation, which at that point had never been scientifically proven, and which, based on the work of Underwriters Laboratory, so ULFSRI, Fire Safety Research Institute, substantially have started to move away from all of that. Now, I, in my view, NFPA 1700, so the Guide to Structural Firefighters, Chapter 10 in particular, which is the essentially is the tactical considerations. That is your menu of tactical options, which sets out from, it deals with the water attack through to the to the air, to air, so water, air, so attack, ventilation, or anti-ventilation. That to me is probably the best piece of guidance out there that I am aware of. That for your control yeah. measure tactics is what I would be directing any policy writer towards. Mm-hmm. It is evidence based. It's current, and quite frankly, it's 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 far superior to anything that I've seen. That's where we. It's twenty twenty one, wasn't it? The most recent version of that. October, yeah, October twenty one, I think, Pete. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. It frustrates me they don't make it freely available though, because I've tried. I'm going to have to buy one. I've tried multiple times to try and find it online. It's freely available, but it's not. But you can you, okay. can you can log in and and register on the NFPA site, but all you can access is sort of a flick page thing. You're right. You can't download it's it. It's frustration, and I get it's someone's intellectual property. But when you put these things behind paywalls, this is you know for you know the safety of communities and emergency responders. I, I feel like this stuff should be freely available, but that's just my personal opinion. Of course, I would say that. Look, I I, I, I absolutely share that. I mean, the thing in fairness, the the ULFSRI fire safety portal that is freely available, as indeed you know, if you look at the. That, for all intents and purposes, is funded by FEMA through the assistance to firefighters grants. You know, it's it's a let let me let me say that there's there's there is nothing you could compare that to in the UK, should we say? Mm-hmm. Which is which is a bit of a shame, I think. You know what I mean? I'm being very diplomatic there, Pete, but I just yeah. feel it's a bit of a shame that the UK Fire and Rescue Service, which was once the envy of the world in terms of its standing and you know if you, if you look at the the doctrine and such like that, that we should fall so far behind let me be clear though that that's i think in technical rescue i think we are i think we're really good things like okra you know there's some fantastic mm-hmm. stuff getting done there i think our command and control is 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 really good i think our ba the particularly the ba the accountability you know so Ops Guidance BA is absolutely first right. class. You know, I did, when I went over to Australia, the first thing really jumped out was the complete absence of anything remotely like Ops Guidance BA. You know, it's, it's really from the get go, I was, I was on that. You know, so, whoa, what 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 mm-hmm. is our accountability here? You know, in respect, mm-hmm. even something as simple as you know rapid deployment with the with the watch officer being the entry control operative, you know, nothing, complete absence of any of that really in, in any formalised sense until there was stage one and two, but it didn't kick in in anything like the way that uh, that, that we would get to. N- another discussion, but, but the point I'm making is it's not all bad, but I think in respect of doctrine for the reasons we've discussed, that's where, I, I, and, and it is so fundamental to firefighter safety which surely mm-hmm. that's got to be our driving motive. Because if your firefighters aren't safe, I mean, I, what sort of service can you be reassured you're delivering to the public mm-hmm. if you can't be sure that you, you know, you're know watching as such that your firefighters are safe? Looking back for a second, because it's something we haven't uh, mentioned yet, but if we just go here for a second, in comparison to the years you served in the military, uh, the doctrine, the high regard for agreed and followed uh, standard practices, uh, military guidance. How? What was the shift like for you when moving? And this is not to say one is better than the other as such. They're very different things. Um, how did you square that circle when you saw the changes going on in the fire and rescue services and the sheer diversity of implementation of what should be agreed principles uh, sort of nationally? I mean, you, you make an excellent point. You know, the, the the UK military doctrine is produced centrally and it is adopted irrespective of your cap batch, irrespective yeah. of your, irrespective of whether you're, you know, like I was in the parachute regiment or if you're in the Royal Marines, you know, or, or, or the RAF regiment, whatever it may be. Fundamentally, your doctrine is the same. Your military doc, your section battle drills are the same. Hmm. You know, it, 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 there is one way of doing it. It's the right way. When I first joined, there was a there was a degree of standardisation which I think was brought together and consolidated through central training at the Fire Service College. But of hmm. course, that was all. There, there is a view there to that say got that got scattered to the wind, didn't it? Um, when the, the, the services started the training themselves, when funding was uh, reinterpreted, redistributed. I wonder if that was, we had Dominic Wellman on not so long ago. And again, obviously he wasn't present at the time, but he's currently managing director of the college. And he was able to pinpoint some of the connective uh, contributing factors to how things got so disparate. And everyone, not self-deployed is probably very offensive because these are all subject matter experts just at different parts of the UK. But 
it, it did seem like some fell far behind, some continued to surge ahead. Um, but everybody got into siloed working before, you know, people started coming together for things like NOG. Look, th- th- there was a dismantling of all of the all of the the the, the, the fine rescue service in- infrastructure, you know, from JCDD, the exams, mm. everything. The the the, the argument with the baby was thrown out with the bathwater, and everything then devolved to the sector, but but without necessarily the resourcing to to support that, you know. And, and then you're down to yeah. well-meaning people essentially trying to do stuff in the dinner hour, you know. Yeah. So fast forward to like fast forward to Mate, not, that's not, that's the the like the narrative of most training departments still in the UK now. It's yeah. you know they're so busy just trying to deliver. You, you're so busy working in the thing, you never get to work on the thing. I'm so you're teaching stuff still that you're like this isn't right and this isn't like what I've been reading up online and this is nothing to do with or it's very different from what I've learned on the latent um, you know professional development course that I went in wherever, but there's no uh or there's very little available national uh, training resource for people to people to be able to bring themselves back into line or even bring their services uh training uh up to current standards that are scientifically based today's podcast is powered by our partner lifelines and their revolutionary approach to functional hydration just like in firefighting water is essential for body function but studies show more than 80 percent of firefighters are dehydrated A 25-year study findings from the National Institute of Health showed poor hydration to be linked to early aging and chronic disease and even mild dehydration results in significant negative impact outcomes including headaches, exhaustion, rapid pulse, irritability and poor cognitive function. A study conducted by Yale University showed that participants who were just 1% dehydrated had a 12% increase in errors when performing tasks that required cognitive flexibility. In addition, dehydration is shown to worsen mood and attitude, contribute to confusion and poor decision making and negatively affect memory and judgment. In other words, you really don't want your incident commander, firefighter or for that matter any first responder on a critical scene to be even slightly dehydrated. Mild dehydration occurs when a person is just 1.5% dehydrated, a condition that does not even trigger the third response in most people so just imagine how quickly a firefighter or any first responder can and does become dehydrated in their day-to-day duties which is why i address my hydration first thing every day with lifelines go into the notes for this episode and specifically check out lifelines hydro fuel and hydro og by clicking in the notes for the podcast for a clean energy solution designed for those who demand more from their day now back to the show look i I, I go back to as the chair of the operations coordination committee, as was back then, I often would use the analogy, this is like trying to juggle chickens, you know, getting consensus. There was Back then there was 45 services in, in England, yeah. three in Wales, one in Scotland, one in Northern Ireland, plus the Crown Dependencies. So there's over 50 fire and rescue services, you've got 50 individual chief officers. Yeah. It, believe me, Pete, it was it was it was a bit of a challenge <laughs> to try and get any it's sort like of herding cats. <laughs> As I say, juggling chickens was my uh now you go back to what you've just described there. And I and I have made recommendations to this effect when having undertaken inspections within Wales in my current role around consistent standardized doctrine, operational risk assessment, control measure knowledge, control measure tactics, menu of tactical options, each of which then If it doesn't already have a standard practice or a technique as contained within the Fire and Rescue Service Training and Development Manual, then the service, and in Wales, there's some excellent examples there of of individual training packages. We call them micro-teachers, which essentially is the sort of thing you could search up on YouTube. It is a best practice demonstration. EDIP, explain, demonstrate, imitate practice best practice demonstration filmed on YouTube type sort of package, which is then available. And my argument being, yes, there should be the operational risk assessment, which all of these control measure tactics would be then articulated because they are your fundamental control measures. But each one of them must have its own training package, which has the underpinning knowledge, the hazard knowledge, which you can do through like a learn pro type platform. But then conversely, there has to be the practical application of that that can be done on a fire station with limited training resource. 
But of course, you, you will know as well as I do, you're from a training background, but not every watch manager is. You are a hostage to fortune as a chief officer as to the to the levels of, of skill of your and this is not this is not a criticism, you know, that, that you, you would have on any given day in Merseyside, I'd have you know, I'd, I'd have twenty six, probably have twenty six, twenty seven individual crew whatever we had, depending on how many pumps were available, mm-hmm. all of whom might be tasked with delivering training on that day on station training. And you get twenty eight, twenty nine different versions of the of the same thing. Absolutely. <laughs> Which is why one of the things we did that produced something called the safe person assessment for every single bit of kit on the fire engine and every single control measure tactic. Don't get me wrong, Pete, it was very rudimentary, but it was something. It was standardised and it gave a resource to watch managers to take off the shelf, you know, within within the structured programme. That is a resource then that they can rely on step by step. That's the standardised way. That's the right way to do it. That's what good looks like. And of course, if you're the station manager looking to do the ops assurance on that, then you then have something standardised to, right, that's what they should be doing in respect of learning outcomes and so forth. So much better if that's done on a YouTube platform because you can physically watch them doing it. You know, instructors mm-hmm. themselves would be demonstrating the technique and then you go out in the yard mm-hmm. and do it. And, and that... But it's exactly what you're saying. It, it, it This requires investment. It requires time and effort. That's the thing with having everyone trying to do their own thing. You know, you'll know far, far better than me the the financial challenges fire and rescue services are facing. Everyone just got a pay rise, which is fantastic. But over 80% of fire and rescue services funding now is committed solely to paying the boys and girls that work within those organizations. So training departments seem to be shrinking more and more, you know, which echoes back to this, uh, you know, looking for regional uh, resources, services joining together, the re-emergence and and rise of the college as an example for a center of uh, learning excellence. We do need to lean in and work together more uh, to, 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 to address these challenges. Of that, there is no doubt, Pete, and, and you, know, you, you through my whole tenure as chief officer at Merseyside, you know, I, I in every single year dealt with. Uh, it's not. Uh, this is just a fact. These these are not. These are statements of fact. You know, our budget was substantially reduced. Mm. Central, the revenue support grant was substantially reduced, and we were limited to what we could raise on the council mm. tax precept which meant that every single year we had a big deficit. Mm. And you, you it, it is challenging in the extreme to think that you can it, at best probably maintain rather than look to see to improve your, your, your performance, you know, which the public mm. rightly, rightly expect that that's what we should be doing. And indeed, you know, our staff, they rightly deserve that, that their service should be invested in. And, it's a big service as well, Merseyside. 23, I think they've got 23, 23, 24 stations left now. It, it, uh... it, it used to be, Pete, it's probably half the size it was when, it, when it, you know, unfortunately, mm. I had to oversee the, the we had to lose. Five Horrible years. time, mate. That's one of those things I'd love to actually zoom in on because people forget with the chief fire officers, there is no easy solution. There's no solutions at all. There's only trade-offs. Um, and you can't operate like you would with a business where you would budget for something for next year and go over budget because you can see retirement or you can see a change of the wind. You have very stringent legislative framework um, and also ramifications, including legal ramifications and imprisonments if you do not uh, responsibly manage the funding of that service. No, indeed. And look, let me be clear, you know, it is it is entirely right and proper that you are held to account. You know, that's, cool. that, that, that is, that's right. Look, I, I, it, if you look at the, 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 the narrative and the, it must have been the, the Integrated Risk Management Plan of 2016, which is, we, we were some way into austerity then, and that's when we were having to start to make some of the real, you know, we'd gone well beyond the point of, there was certainly no low-hanging fruit, and we'd gone well beyond the point now where it wasn't going to have a, a, a... You trimmed all the fat by that point, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. And it, 
and, and we've done we, we've taken other measures to improve productivity so for example you know not particularly popular things please i grant you but things like shift equalization so instead of 9 15 12 12 to maximize training time ssri mm-hmm. you know risk reduction work and such like i won't get into that but you, you know you, you, we, we've taken all of the measures that we could to ensure that that we absolutely maximized you know the capacity mm-hmm. that we had to to ensure that the highest levels of training were getting undertaken and that community risk management work and so forth but ultimately you know the the I made the point in the the narrative of the twenty in the introduction to the 2016 integrated risk management plan said I, I need to make a point here that in respect say where, where we've looked and we've set a, a 10 minute response standard I said let, let me be absolutely clear to everyone for the avoidance of doubt that has got nothing to do with integrated risk management plan and everything to do with AA root finder. That is simply mm. where we are positioning stations on the strategic network. Yeah. Because we know if, if we drop down to 10, we can cover all the Mersey side in 10 minutes from a stand and start on 90% of occasions. Not negotiables, based on fact, you know? Yeah, and, and again, that was, it was, an, it was it, the point being it's, but it has nothing to do with risk. It's got everything to do with, I, I if I've got a set of response stand, then it's as much about given the mobilising officer and fire control some very clear parameters around what stations do you cover when the number of pumps drops below because it's reasonably foreseeable that they're going to. So what is your guidance, what you cover to ensure that most that most equitable maintenance mm. of, of response once you are exposed to the day-to-day realities of, uh, of responding to incidents, you knowing the volume that, that, that comes with that. Mm. You mentioned uh, before we came on today, and it's an interesting subject maybe to talk about now, some of your most enjoyable times in the fire and rescue service were your rider station officer days, your firefighter days, which is wonderful. And it's not to say you didn't uh, take value from and add value in the other roles that you later pursued. But talking about the conversation that we're having there around the difficulties that chief fire officers and, and senior leadership are facing, when I look at things like the NFCZ website, I see a lack of of hunger and interest in some of these more senior positions and please tell me again if i'm if i'm wrong there and you're seeing a different side to the coin i worry about top talent not wanting to or not being attracted to the sector for those more senior positions because of the inherent challenges that these individuals are facing at those senior levels and even for yourself as you reflect back it's very difficult to exist at that level how did you manage it personally, cognitively, the, the pressures and day-to-day life of, of those levels beyond, you know, rider station officer that you then pursued? What I would say is, and you, you touched on this before with, with your your reference to probably the way people working within training departments feel. What I felt, I did feel like I, I was constantly firefighting, pun intended, Whereas, do you know the irony is now having had the the opportunity to be in the role that I'm in currently as a as a, as a HMI, and having that mm. time to step out, to reflect, mm. to read more, I would I would be and clearly I suppose as you get older you you you, you mature don't you as well I guess. <laughs> but, that's the theory. I'm sure. But sure, I, I'm not sure I could claim that myself, but there you go. Anyway, <laughs> I, I actually do believe I would make a far better chief officer now than, oh, God, yeah. than then because I've I, I got, got all yeah. that, the benefit of that experience. You can unplug from the, I don't need to panic about this right now. There's bigger things at play. Some things will actually resolve themselves without me panicking them for two or five days, and it'd be far more beneficial for me to take this next three hours to fully get elbow deep and immerse myself in some of the guidance, some of what other services are doing, what the NHS, what the police are doing, it would allow for more cognitive bandwidth to probably make better decisions in reflection. Und- look, undoubtedly, please, undoubtedly. Driving into work of the morning, you know, at firstly, I would, I would always just look at my rank markings and think, you, you, you are, you, you are minding this. You know, it's not about you. It, it's, it, it's, 
it is a huge, huge privilege to be in this role to serve. And, and I just got to do my very best to live up to that, you know, because, because yeah. of the fantastic people that, that, that we work with that, and, and those people that we serve. So, you know, sort of guiding principle stuff. It was full on, Pete. It was full on, you know, it, it, it wasn't it wasn't particularly family friendly. The, I think the only reason, probably in in, in a personal sense, that my, my wife she retired now, but she was a watch manager in the USAR team, dog handler. So uh, she was on call as well. She understood, I guess, a, a lot of that. And I think that's probably why we, we probably got through it, because we both understood. Yeah, what yeah, yeah. It did. Whether that would have been the case if, if, if it were not so, you know, who knows. But the look, I, I recognise, and it's probably, it may not be any different now, we were struggling in Merseyside. We were really struggling to get people to step up from firefighter to crew manager, watch manager. And I get that. Yeah. You know, I understood people, why, why would we want to take that extra responsibility on? I get that. I can remember. Well, why though? Because you did. And many do. So just 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 expand there for a second. What what is it? Is it the desire that I'm always one of those? I'm not going to throw stones unless I'm willing not to get on the field and do it myself. Look, I, I the, the, some of the reasons that were articulated to me, you know, for all the extra responsibility, you know, you held to account, and you know, why, why should they do that? You know, it's hardly any extra money, and, and they, they were the sort of things. And look, what I would always say is, is look, when when have I? As the chief, when have I ever not stood and backed you all? When have, when have I ever not done that? You know, because, you know, let's be clear, you know, this is me speaking to, to and I look, I, I every single day, Pete, I'd get out on station. I would get out on station. I, I, I detested being stuck in headquarters. I would get out on station. I would get a train with the crews. I'd, like I'd, I, I was probably, it was, I'm, I'm not saying this what you should. I'd drill with them. I'd throw ladders up with them. I'd rock up to jobs far more than I ever should, than there would be an argument that I ever should have done. I would take charge of more jobs, arguably, than I should have yeah. done. But I loved it, you know what I mean? And, and, and actually, that's where you see the ground truth. That's where you see mm. reality. You know, not, it's, mm. that's, that's where it's hang on. It, it, you when you start lifting the stones. That that's a good point that you say there, like you know, impact intended versus impact felt. The path of travel of intention, policy, ideas between chief fire officer and firefighter, there's a lot of messy middle to lose the ground truth between that. So if you don't get an opportunity to be in front of those individuals, what you intended to happen when you had that conversation with your area managers, group managers, whoever you know, six weeks ago versus what is actually manifesting after the Chinese whispers and the misinterpretations. Completely. And, and but within, the, absolutely right, Pete. But within that, of course, there is the dichotomy that where, as the chief, the hardest thing, I can only speak for myself, others play with have another view. Mm-hmm. The hardest thing I always thought was not doing what I wanted to do. Not mm-hmm. doing what, it, because I could. Theoretically, you can't be the chief, do whatever you like. Not strictly true, of course. You can't. You've got to yeah, write yeah, responsibility yeah. all the time so far. But and 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 I'd experienced, you know, that like long screwdriver people, you know, that micromanagement thing. And that just, in my opinion, experience just switches people off. Long screwdriver. I've never heard it described as that before. That's fantastic. Yeah, the long screw. That reaching down and micromanaging. That's yeah, a yeah. great articulation of it. I've not heard that one before. And the other, the other one for you is like the pond weed just strangles the life out of people. You know, it's just, yeah. just uh, so what I would do with with my colleagues, you know, my, my, the, my leadership team colleagues, right? We, we will agree the strategic vision. We would be lined up behind this safe, effective fire. It was all about ops, public expectation. We will be a good fire and rescue service. Let's be clear: the public don't really know what good looks like in many respects. Yeah. We do, and we need to live up to that. That's what we're about. Safe, effective firefighters. That, that's how we deliver. That's how we deliver good. You know what I mean? Not into badge collecting. Not into any of that. Mm-hmm. You know, we put the hard yards in. We're all well paid. You know, we, 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 we earn our money. We do the right thing. That's a values thing. And I would set like, that's the vision. You go and deliver that. That's the effect. To use the military-based analogy, what is the effect we are trying to achieve? Like, we all agree that's the effect. Like, you go do that. 
it's not for me to tell you the journey, but, but that is the destination. Of course, that would frustrate the life out of me then, but because then I'd, that's how I'd do it. Like, back, back, just because that's how I'd do it, you know, let them get on and do it. But then it does yeah, yeah, yeah. in that thing around, do you see what I mean? You, you, can, you, can, be, you can run a yeah. dictatorship, but here's the thing, Pete, you know, I used to say, and, and I would always say to them, look, if you think that I'm, no, I, I, you should choose my language carefully. If you think I am talking rubbish, then yeah. I want you to challenge me. I want you to tell me, but I want you to tell me why, and I want you to tell me what we do instead. Mate, this is one of my biggest frustrations and challenges. So I'm one, and the podcast is an example of it. Strong beliefs weekly held is a is a saying I really enjoy it because I'm very passionate about the things I say. But if you can through science, evidence, demonstrate to me why what I'm saying is bollocks, then I am happy to onboard your opinion and to, and to drive with it. And I will, I'll put some horsepower behind your belief. I'll open some doors. I'll kick down some doors if I need to. But you are a little bit like me. You're a white British male. You seem like you're a big fella who possibly exercises. I have honestly come up against some difficulties and again it's probably the the intention i've tried to get across when i'm communicating versus perhaps what's felt when i get very passionate about things and you sound like you're a passionate individual yourself how have you balanced that because you said there please you know if you think i'm talking rubbish push back against me challenge me a lot of people don't like difficult conversations they don't know the difference between an argument and a debate I think debates are very good. They're very healthy. They're very necessary at leadership levels. Even at crew manager, watch manager, you need to be able to debate and have healthy discussion around the intention and what is agreeable, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what are we about. You're an ex-para. You're a very disciplined man. How have you balanced that? In Because I think our aversion to discipline uh, is a real issue with the degradation of standards, training, and, 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 and. But it's very hard to differentiate the two when people just see it sometimes as, as hostile, as overbearing, as, you know what I mean? I, I do. I know exactly what you mean, please. I know exactly what you mean. I, we're I not the military, is what I get told. And I, we're not. You're right. No, I, and, I, and I can recall, you know, there was there was always this militaristic being bandied around as if it was a bad thing the uk yeah. military is outstanding it's our greatest export by a country mile we, we should strive to be like the uk but it's people using the term militaristic who have no understanding whatsoever what the military is all about no mm-hmm. i was in the parachute regiment controlled aggression mm-hmm. highly aggressive highly highly you have to be lightly armed you, you, you know you can only carry what you can parachute in with. You got to mm-hmm. be you got to be robust. You got to be you got to be tough. You're operating in really austere, difficult. Can you know? I, I joined not long after the Falklands. All of my directing staff were Falklands vets. They were not. It was brutal, Pete. They were not going to accept anything other than the absolute highest standard to go up to the battalions. And why should they? Rightly so. Now look, the fine rescue service is not in the same space as that. I accept that, but there is a requirement for standards. I think it's harder for us to articulate success, as I think is what the problem is there, sorry. Like with military, there's a very clear success, you know, whereas with us, I've never been to a fire that's still burning now. Eventually, they all go out, even if you're a really shit firefighter. I, ironically, Pete, the, going back to my earlier point, they'll go out whether you do something or you don't, you know what I mean? Because they'll either the yeah. fuel get consumed or the oxygen will get the better. But yeah, take the point. Look, it is fundamentally important here that... We must treat people with you when, when it, in the workplace, it is a place of work. And your behavior in that place of work, you must be respectful to your colleagues. You don't have to like them, but you absolutely yeah. should be respectful to them. And that extends to if someone has a view, if someone has an opinion, they have the right to have that, that opinion to be heard. What I did, and, I, and look, I know what you're saying, please. You beg, lad, you intimidate people. It's a, they don't want to. I would just, I would... Continue. That's not the intention. Absolutely. It's just I get very excited and passionate. Look, 
absolutely, and I know I understand that for the same reasons. I, I, I occupy the same. I'm space. probably asking for some private coaching here. I'm like, how, help me. How did how did you achieve that and get people on board without? First thing, damage? I, you would need to ask other people if I did achieve it. It wouldn't be for me to say that. But what I what I would do, always, always. Firstly, what I would do, I would set something out. Right. This is the, the articulate. This is the issue. Discuss. And I would step back and I would deliberately not speak until the end. Okay. Difficult to do. Difficult to do because I, I want to get it. I find it hard even with the podcast. I keep interrupting because I get too excited. And, that, and, look, and that's all good. <laughs> and that, and, and, and that, that, that enthusiasm and passion should never be stifled. But I'm, asking, but I'm saying in, in the strategic context, strategic leadership team, I would always try, I would try, whether I was always successful again, others would take a view. Right, there's the issue, discuss, and I would let them let them speak. And very quickly, my colleagues stepped up because they're, 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 all, they're, they're all highly talented people, fantastic people. Very quickly, step up. I'm like, okay, this is good, this is good. Exactly, you put, this is good, healthy debate. We don't all have to agree. We don't all have to like each other. That's that's mm. that's sound. But we will respect each other and we will treat each other respectfully. Because that's and we will respect each other's views, whether we agree them with with them or, or we don't. Unless they're completely outrageous, you know, and, and clearly mm-hmm. if, if or if somebody's saying something highly offensive, then absolutely that gets called out. But there's no question about that. But it's it's that, you know, for me, th- these are just isn't that a bit of a false economy though and what i'm about to try to say there is in higher levels of services people are already conditioned to an extent to act very professionally they do need to get shit done they have to actually have delivered some value otherwise they wouldn't be sat where they are a lot of the cultural issues that we see emerging i feel personally across the uk fire and rescue services are at the lower levels where it's perhaps more difficult to challenge people are given a much wider bandwidth of a lot of deadwood on watches, a lot of people that have low standards, poor firefighting. And because at your level, it's like you you know people are marching to the beat of a different drum already. Understand the point you make completely. And let, let, let me be clear. Given the, the, the unique intimacy of the fire and rescue service environment on the watch, I did 15 years on the Sox beat, so I get it. You know, I know what you mean. I know. And, you know, I, I, I was a firefighter for... You know, what six seven years before I before I stepped up before becoming an LF. So you know I was at a reasonable time as a firefighter. Now you're right. People don't like confrontation. Don't like saying no. I'll be yeah. honest with you. As as a, as a watch officer, I was always of the view. I, I'm not here to win popularity contests. Yeah, I'm here to do a job. And you know I can remember. I won't name the watch, but first as a rider station officer, first night it was a Saturday night. First night on there with that particular watch, 1800 parade, all good, right? Detail everyone off, you know, 1830, all hands fire cut. You, know, you can imagine, drill, drill, Saturday night, drill, we, we don't drill, you do, all hands fire cut. Right, we're getting out in the train, what we did. And there was a load of children and Pete, they weren't happy about it, you know, be load of children, we got out, we train. And I'll be honest with you, they weren't that good. Yeah, they weren't doing any training, you know what I mean, which is hardly surprising. And, yeah, been there. And, and so it went on, you know, and on days, drill all morning, SSRI and all afternoon would be out, be busy. Devil makes work for idle hands, Pete. You'll know that mm-hmm. yourself, you know what I mean? No such mm-hmm. thing as a bad watch, only a bad watch manager. We grafted hard, you know what I mean, and we trained. But I think with a purpose and a mission, that's what keeps people in line as well. That's what keeps people with a sense of purpose. Like you said, the devil makes work for idle hands. It's like if you give them lots of time, they will start bickering. They will start twatting about. It. They will start stealing things, making mistakes, being mischievous. And behaving inappropriately towards each other and everything, yeah. you know, all the other appalling yeah. things that have got no place in any organisation, let alone the fire and rescue service. No, I think for me, the, the, the point I make, we, we had... The, we, we, this particular watch, we had a job, Liverpool City Centre, it was a line rescue, not a technical rescue, we're first in attendance, so this is the days before we had the technical rescue teams. 
and we put together a line system. We affect the complicated line rescue, and we get this. This guy's getting chased by the police. Jumps over a uh, set of railings and falls whatever twenty odd feet down into a basement. So we fully seriously and nice. leave the paramedics. Like, oh, yeah, we're going to get him out. So leave it with us. Set a line system up. Lower a, lower a firefighter down. Get him packaged. All them out. All good. Relatively straightforward and true. Mm-hmm. We got a big crowd around us, you know, and they're all like, oh, that, that was impressive." And you see the crew, you know, on the pump driving back to state, you know, driving back to station. Yeah. All like, oh, that was good. And I just turned around and like, was it Jack Nicholas that said, "The more the practice, the luckier we get." Yes. Hundred percent, mate. Hundred percent. Practice, the luckier we get. And I always say this: this is my thing with the fire service because actually. With the military, with the greatest of respect, I think the, the percentages are very small. It's something like 20%, if not less, of the military ever deploy into a conflict zone and will actually ever do the thing they're trained to do. Absolutely. Yet they train so much more passionately and so much more diligently sometimes than we ever do. But if you're a firefighter, there's a high likelihood you are going to do the I thing. I, absolutely, Pete. You know, I, I joined after the Falklands and I left before Afghanistan. But the whole, almost the whole time I was in, we were UK lead parachute battalion groups. So back in the, it was five airborne brigade back in the day, probably sixteen air assault now. And my abiding memory is not look. I, I, I you know, your, my, your memory plays tricks. It was a long time. It was over thirty years ago now. But we were we were training and exercising constantly. We were out in the field. We were soldiering, and we were at such a high level of readiness. And that stayed with me. That, that has stayed with yeah. me. And because I knew I had absolute confidence that if we were to deploy, I had absolute confidence, you know, that from you know, O Group and Aldershot, off to South Cerny, the Air Mountain Centre, from there, you know, RAF line and I don't know, four or five hours horrific low level flying on the Hercules with the RAF SF pilots, you know, everyone being yeah. stuck on each other. You'd parachute in, you'd probably do a 50-odd mile advance to contact because it was all based on, like, the Falklands and the long tab across the Falklands. Carrier outrageous amounts of kit, all the rest of it. Live battalion attack and then dig in. Horrific. And then do, and then do it all again. You know what I mean? <laughs> Off the ground, Salisbury Plain, Brecon, you name it. We're all over the world doing that. Yeah. Fantastic. But you know what? I come back to the more we practice, the luckier we get. Now I'm not. I am not advocating mm-hmm. going to those extremes. What I am advocating is, you know, in line with 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 HSG sixty five, you know, guide to successful health and safety management policy, organisational arrangements to deliver the policy, strategic planning and implement, monitor, audit, review. It's not hard. It's a fine rescue service. It's not difficult, Pete. Yes, we had some yeah. financial challenges. We're challenge. not curing cancer here, folks. No, my, you know what I mean? This is stuff is that you haven't got to reinvent the wheel. You've got it. You've got it, mate. It is a very, very narrow, compared to, say, a local authority, which would deal with anything from adult social care, children's services. Oh, and lots of complexity things. and quagmire means, there. Absolutely. You know, we are dealing with yeah. structured fires, technical rescue, hazmat, mm-hmm. any other humanitarian special service. It's all reasonably foreseeable. There's a load of hazard knowledge. There's a load of control measure knowledge. Mm-hmm. We can trade. You know, the one commodity we've got in abundance, particularly with whole time firefighters, complete opposite for the RDS, clearly, time. We've got time in abundance. Let's use that time. Let's train. With the greatest of respect, you know, Sleeping for half your shift doesn't make you safe, and it doesn't make the public safe. You know, I'm not getting to. I won't get into that, but you know what I'm saying. Training, exercising, because in the absence of the real thing, it's the next best thing. Yeah. Right? And we are only as good as the next job we go to. And let me tell you, Pete, some of the research that I've done. What it shows is, in any hundred structure fires, like typically. This is based on the research I've done. 60 of them are going to be no firefight action. Right? Okay. No firefight action. Pan of food, I was on arrival. That sort of thing. Overheated like fit. Yeah, yeah. The remaining 40, 25 of them are remain in the room of origin. Bear in mind, the incident recording system is extremely limited, actually, in the way in which this information is captured. It, it gives you I did time. note that earlier when you said about the limitations of IRS. Just to expand on on that for people perhaps earlier in their careers that perhaps aren't adopting 
a junior officer or LF position. Just expand on what IRS is and how we record this data. So the incident recording system essentially records the details of every single incident that the Fire and Rescue Service attends. So what it doesn't do, it won't record, You won't a log won't get created if your appliance is turned back on route, for example. But essentially for everything that we attend, there is a, a record and it's for statistical analysis purposes. But if we deal in the fire space, this is where I get, this is my starting point for this data. So every 100 structure fires, dwelling fires I'm dealing with now, to be clear, so not, not all structure fires, this is dwelling fires. So FSEC code 01020708, that, that, that within that group. So essentially, structures within which people live, okay, which yes. is the, the, the biggest volume number anyway in that, that data set. So 60 of the, of the 100, so 60%, I'm rounding up slightly, but indulge me. No firefighting action. The remaining 40, 25, remain within the room of origin which means in all likelihood, they're more likely to be fuel controlled, i.e. whatever we did, they were never getting beyond the room of origin. It's mm -hmm. the remaining 15 that go beyond the, the room of origin. So 15 out of, out of every 100 that are recorded proper, you'd argue proper like that. Not, not the, the 40 are going to be working jobs, but your 15 are the ones where yeah. the potential for real, some significant damage to someone's house. Yeah. Irrespective of the of, of what the IRS might suggest, because there is a field there that eight point two zero, I think it is, status of fire on arrival, and more often than not, with these fifteen, the person filling it out is saying if the fire was beyond the room of origin. What it actually says is fire or heat damage beyond the room of origin. Mm -hmm. and what I would say is, a put aside the fact that you're asking turkeys to vote for Christmas with that one. Yes. <laughs> and it spread after we got there. Like, put that aside. My <laughs> argument would be to say, unless it's coming out of every door and window, which we've already established, very unlikely to be. Yeah. Because, because people in the UK tend not to have every door and window open. And therefore, if it isn't, then back to the Dutch thing, it's more likely to be ventilation controlled or limited or the, mm -hmm. the Yank research and so forth. So it's going to be heavily smoke locked. The first thing I'd say is, well, how did you know? You know, how did you know it was beyond the room of origin? How could you tell? Yeah. Did you thermal yeah. scan? Mm -hmm. Might have done, but, you know, I'm, maybe they didn't. Which is where, this is where some of you, fundamentally, you know, to be a good watch officer, you need to know your stuff. First thing I'd be expecting, 360 thermal scan. Mm -hmm. People, some some services are doing it. Establish, you know, have you got? Can we establish what, what is the room compartment of origin? Because you know what, if if you, if you invest a little bit of time at the beginning, you, you you may well be able to establish that simply by observation. You know, even taking your glove mm -hmm. off, feeling the glass, you know, basic things mm -hmm. like that. You know, looking through the letterbox, you know, that sort of stuff. You yeah, know, yeah. just take a little bit of time. But whatever, you know, the, 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 we'll go back to the, 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 the research. It isn't going to come as a great surprise to you, this, Pete, that, that, that pretty much almost on every single one of the 15, almost, it, it, almost every single one of them, the first informative message, when they actually send one in any reasonable good period of time, to, to be a hose reel. Yep. Now, the first question... Um, that, the script. So the first question I'm then asking is, okay, to that OIC, rhetorically, because clearly I can't interview the OIC, although that would be the obvious follow-up thing to do, would be to say to them, okay, on the IRS, you've said that fire is beyond the room of origin when you get there, or there's fire and heat damage beyond the room of origin, which would strongly suggest to me that is a post-flash over fire. So can you tell me how you thought you were ever going to suppress that with, mil, with a 19 mil reel flowing 100 litres a minute? That's the first question I'd be asking. Mm. Because the answer to that is you can't. Mm. You, want the flow rate. you do not have the flow rate. Now, people like Paul Grimwood, absolute solid citizen, mm. top quality guy, you know, Euro firefighter, really, really good, publicly available. Mm -hmm. There's no restrictions on downloading it. Paul's research in respect of optimum or tactical flow rates that in NOG, 
you know, surface area times five, little simplistic fire ground calcs. If that's a post flash over fire, why you why didn't you know what prospect do you think you've got of suppressing that with Osreal? You ain't gonna do it. Mm. Straight away, straight away. That's what I'm saying is but what I think I can demonstrate is we're actually making it worse after we get there. Now, Paul, the LFB did some research mm. about this a while ago, broadly suggesting a similar thing. So why is that? Well, because for all of the reasons we talked about earlier, is by making an entry, you create the flow. You're immediately interrupting the compartmentation yeah. and you're you're feeding that fire exactly. without the facility to extinguish and, it. And if you don't immediately hit it hard, which pulsing with yeah. the best will in the world is if not... If you're going to go through, make slow progress and just pulse as you go whilst exactly. it's feeding that well, it's, fire. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Now... The Dutch did a piece of research. If you think the Dutch four-quadrant model that they introduced after the Egypt Pond fire in 2008 with the three firefighters were killed in the boatyard, essentially the four quadrants, defensive exterior, offensive exterior, defensive interior, offensive interior. And the, the rationale being offensive interior is the very last thing you do. And you'll only do it if, if there are persons reports. You'll only do it if you've got no other option. But what they looked at is the piece of research they did, and the Americans have got some excellent case studies on this on the ULFSLI website, where the, the, on every single occasion, an exterior attack, whether you use the hose reel, main branch, or calves, achieved a much more rapid knockdown than the interior attack. Because it's quicker. It would do. I know it's counterintuitive. I'll be honest with you, Pete. It's what we always used to back in the early 90s rocking up at one of the unoccupied that we would get on probably four or five times a night, some nights, not every night, but on, in, in care, you know, in the tenements where we'd rock up and say, me 45 mil flight length on the back of the pump locker, AWG smooth bore, knock it off, fire it up into the, hit it externally initially, knock off, get into the doorway, fire the straight stream up into the ceiling, which, of course, was it in the hot gases. We didn't particularly know that back then because the science wasn't there. But that's what we did anyway. And then you'd progress in and you'd hit the fire as soon as you could. And we put it back. Great Dutch quote, okay, from Ricky Weaver, the, 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 the new view of firefighting. The best form of gas cooling is to put the fire out. Have you heard the, um, the combine harvester analogy? I've not. I, mean, I, don't, I may have done, but please enlighten me. It's the uh, and it, it, I suppose it relates partially to uh, casualty-centered rescue. But if there's a child stuck in the uh, in the field and there's a combine harvester running and you're looking for the child, is the best thing to split up and everyone go looking for the child, or is the best thing to go and switch off the combine harvester? You know, when you're gas calling, pissing about, searching, saying that you're looking for life or you're looking, just put the fucking fire out. You know, if you focus on switching off the source of all of this, then any other any other actions, you know, versus staying in their boundary calling, gas calling, blah, blah, blah. I think that's a training scar from gas rigs as well. And also some CFBT as well, where they don't want you to extinguish the fire because people have to reload the box and mess about for the next run. Let, let's, and that's a training scar that people pick up. Let's let's explore that in a bit more detail, Peter, if we, if we can. But, but but before we do that, so NFPA 1700, whilst saving life will always be the overriding strategic consideration, extinguishing the fire has to be your first tactical objective. And in the hierarchy of hazard and risk control, that is a lim- that's right at the top of the hierarchy. Eliminate the hazard. I always say the clues in the name, fire and rescue. There you go. Fire first. Take that out. And, and absolutely, even if, <laughs> even if it is something as simple as just shutting the door on the fire compartment, Yeah. even if it's only yeah. isolation, if you can't eliminate, under percent, mm. 100%. Going back to the mm. point you make around the trainer. So if you look at, if we've already established that we only take a very small component of Rosander and Gisselson's technique. The guy, the, the pulse in there, okay? Mm-hmm. If we look at, I, I mean, I can't speak for everywhere, but I know that there is a number of services are still using a very rudimentary demonstration unit for their CFBT, 
which essentially mm. is a single story ISO container, unlike, say, the Americans or the Swedish versions now, which are two story where the fire box is elevated from the observation mm. box. It's set, it is a double, it, it, it is two distinctly separate things. There's battles all the way along, still the vertical vent mm. on the roof, but, but fundamentally, we're, we're, we're in one long ISO container where yeah. you have a combination of pallets, MDF, oriented strand board, ply board, whatever yeah. it is. But essentially, you've got a fire load that is fixed, probably equivalent, probably deliver about a one megawatt heat release rate. You've got an optimal yeah. ventilation profile in so much as there's a, vent, there's a vertical vent on the roof. But essentially, it is a bi-directional flow because both doors are open. So you've got the, the inlet vent coming in at the bottom, outlet vent at the top. The firefighters then are in relatively cool air. And yep. you pulse away to your heart's content. To your yep. heart's content. Because the fact is, there is almost zero prospect you are ever going to turn out to that. And mm -hmm. we've probably got a couple of generations now of CFBTIs and therefore firefighters who are experts in that particular type of fire. But here's yeah. the thing, you ain't never going to go to that. Or it's very, very, a kitchen fire with the front door open, with direct mm. line of sight on the kitchen, is probably the closest mm. you're ever going to get to that. Yeah. I think, uh, so I haven't been to a number of facilities across the UK that use that setup. I think the excuse around that is it allows people to see, you know, from incipient to fire growth to closing the box down to decay to different vents. They show the the dropping in the layer. But you're right in terms of the effect on you as a person in that in that compartment and how you would strategically attack or tactically, sorry, tackle that fire. It's not really a very useful model because you don't get the feedback. It's a steel box. So, again, the boundary acts very differently exactly. than yeah. premises in the UK would. A few places have got good ones, though. I mean, West Mids have got, uh, I think it's at um, Albury, is it? Yeah, they They've got much, yeah, a couple of good units there. They've got a good CFBT yeah. uh, setup and instructors. And I think they've actually got, they've got like a high rise they setup are, with right. their exactly. containers. I think they've got like nine containers high or something. But anyway, you're right. The standard uh setup that's sold and i forget who sells it it doesn't matter actually i won't name the company but there's one company in the uk that sells these cfbt boxes with the baffles and the vertical vents and that tends to be the model that a lot of people get isn't it which is a very rudimentary demonstration unit it's not mm. an attack unit and that's the point no, it's getting yeah. used for attack and it is it's simply not that and 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 the the, the demonstration units have evolved substantially but I come back to it. it's the it's the fuel load. Yeah, that mm. that may be representative of a kitchen fire, but it's certainly not representative of a post flashover bedroom fire, which could be up to fifteen megawatts. So probably you know five to well, fifteen times the amount. And the, the the heat flux, you know, you just are not going to get anywhere near that. Nowhere near. No. The only way that's getting put out is with a straight stream on the main branch. You've got to go hard. And, and my view would be it's it from outside first and then transition to your interior attack, flow and move, which, again, counterintuitive. But, you know, I've, I've had that on station visits where, where but we've only got 1,800 litres in the tank. I'm like, yeah, just use it to put the fire out. And what I mean by that is exterior attack initially, like flow for 30 seconds, straight stream, through a window, if, if you're able to, straight stream, steep angle, and train minimal oxygen, water map, so you fire the straight stream at the ceiling, lift the ceiling, spread out, down the walls, maximum heat absorption, 30 yeah. seconds, you're probably throwing, I don't know, you, if you, let's say we use 52 mil low pressure, high mm -hmm. flow system in Merseyside, so the 52 mil yeah. hours based on, on... There's not many 45s left, I think most are 52 you now, hope, I think. I mean, you'd hope so, wouldn't you? I mean, BDAG's been around long enough now. So 52 mm -hmm. mil, low pressure, high flow, flow, flow meters on the pumps, 450 liters a minute. So let's say you're flowing two, 30 seconds, exterior attack, flowing 200 liters. Immediately transition to your interior attack. You're going in, absolutely we're going in. Flow and move, right? 
straight straight flow and move o pattern or whatever depending on your vent profile or just the straight state mm. flowing for say i don't know another 30 seconds another minute then let's say another 400 liters that fire is out that's mm. the po- that, that will suppress a post flash over compartment fire Mm. Yanks show it time and time again, you know, with the, 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 the ULF SLI stuff, 600 litres, okay? You've actually, I, I, I can show you examples from incident logs where they've gone in, they've been pulsing away merrily. The thing's getting away from them. It goes from it goes from either ground to first or from first floor bedroom to the roof. And what do they end up doing? Getting an aerial out, flooding the thing down the, uh, and they're worried about water yeah. damage. I'm like, yeah. Do me a favour, just put the fire out. Put the fire out. 600, you know, let's say in that's the scenario I described, flow 600 litres, you still got 1,200 in the tank. Hmm. Where, where and to be fair, if it, is, uh, if it is if it is a reported, confirmed property fire, you're going to get more than one truck anyway. You get a minimum of three, it's even on pretty much every service across the UK. But even, but even if there's a substantial delay, and let's say in the worst case scenario, yeah. you know, you 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 seven up, you got a crew of four. And let me be clear, I, call, I, I, I'm not advocating. Yeah. You know, I, I, we would always always aim to ride five and there's his side. That extra person, the huge value, huge added value. Let's say four. I'm not even going to entertain three. Not even getting into that. Hmm. But you four riders, absolute minimum. OIC entry control operative. You know, rapid deployment. Step through sequentially. The operational risk assessment should assume this. It should anticipate this. And there's there's a, there's some clear task, you know, analysis there. The the OIC doing the 360, the pump operator engaging the pump. BA where is donning, not starting at this point. Let's assume they're going to don because of the you know so the real good stuff around contamination. We ain't got the sets in the cabs anymore. All good, but they've got that little bit of time that you don. Maybe get the methods of entry gear off. Let's run a 52 mil out. Let's get our attack line, you know, two, 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 length, two, two lengths in the one line to give you maximum sort of uh, interior attack potential. OIC does the 360. Let's say, right, the fire's in, you know, it's in the front room, let's say, front living room. We can say, you know, thermal scan, it's in there. Okay, no windows mm. open. Okay, I'll make a small entry. I'll open one of the quarter lights. Okay, so the OIC's doing that. You know, me BA where is start your methods of entry work on the front door. Open it, but don't open it. You know, breach it, but don't open it. Keep it closed. Yeah. Get set, get ready. Let's, you know, driver, charge the charge the line. Line's charged. OIC can flow through the window. The BA crew done, you know, your objective, you're going to go in. We know the fire is immediately to the left. This is all easy stuff, Pete. I accept that. Go in, suppress the fire, then search, search the whole property. Oh, I see. Straight stream through the window, 30 seconds. You're knocking it right down. Knock it off. Immediately transition it to the uh, to your pump. Oh, I see. Can even do a bit of hose management for them as you, as you, as, as mm-hmm. team Alpha One goes in. They've got the brief. You know they're going in left hand uh, left hand search. They know the fire compartments immediately to the left. Again, I know this is best case scenario, but in they go, bang, put the fire out, knock it off, shut the door behind them. They can drop the branch at the door at that point, search, and they can ventilate as they go. Yeah. You know, I, I, and you can build on that. You can build the complexity. That's what we should be doing on nights. That's what we should be sacking. It relies on a uh, competent and aggressive form of BA. Uh, deployment though and this is one of my frustrations when i i work for an organization uh traveling across the uk assessing uh firefighter apprenticeships for endpoint assessments and ba seems to be getting a lot slower a lot slower um so like you say from that moment that you're opening up these compartments from what was a ventilation controlled fire as as an example you're spending so goddamn long getting to that room of origin just because it's it's a bit like pantomime. People are tick boxing the search procedures sometimes, and uh, it tells me that you could you could you could teach a lot of this, and you'd still wouldn't get the outcome that you were hoping for because people take so goddamn long to get to the room of origin these days. I think. And, and the re- the Dutch research shows that, which is why we're losing properties, which is why it's getting worse after we get there. Pete, how can that be right? 
How can that be right? Mm, I know. You know, to, how can it's that? It's a horrible be right? thing to say, isn't it? It's getting worse after we get there. You and I are having that discussion. You, you, you have highlighted the reasons I know. why. And I'm, I'm thinking, why aren't chief officer? Because you know what? If this isn't important, well, what is? Mm. If this isn't yeah. important, can you tell me what is? Because I, I don't know what it is. I, 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 I don't. For me, that's the, it. Doesn't get culture. any more important than that. That's the the attention at the minute goes to culture, and we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. But um, look, I, I think I we anyway. will be arguing arguing with each other about how you have or haven't offended me whilst the building burns down is sometimes what's happening and that sounds a little bit passive aggressive so i should apologize for the listeners uh, if it seems like i don't think there's value in that there is value in that but i think we're taking the eye off the ball the culture issue is is is, is, is huge nothing is diluting that of course it's it's not, i'm not saying and there is no place there is no place for, for the sort of behaviours that, that, that we're hearing about, yeah. Time Rescue or any other organisation, there is no place for that. But I come back to the devil makes work for idle hands. You know, if, if we, if, if what can we not just focus on our court, what we're here to do, let's all yeah. get invested. Because you know what, if people, if people aren't interested in that, they're in the wrong job. Go and find another job. Yeah. And if they're not interested in the sort, yeah. if they're not passionate about the sort of things we're talking about, well, they've got no business being in the fine rescue service then, have they? I agree with you, mate, but I would I would I would give the argument of how much we are struggling with recruitment and retention now, and we can't rely on lots of ex military people wanting to come into the job because they're often fantastic operators. They're conditioned to uh, a rate of work, they're good at following instruction, can assimilate training very quickly. We can't rely on people that are romantic and passionate about first responders or frontline operators as our base of recruitment now, which I think is one of the biggest challenges because you clearly, you know, retired a little while ago, are still very passionate about the job, hence why I say retired, hence why you continue your role in the emergency services in a different capacity. I worry in total honesty, I worry about future recruitment and stuff like that. And it's kind of one of the reasons of the podcast is I want us to be proud of what we do. I want us to talk about it. I want us to be able to show our passion so that people that are interested in the first responder community have at least somewhere to go to be able to listen to passionate people such as yourself and hopefully feel inspired to come and be part of this great thing. Amen to that, Pete. But I think, mm. you know, I, I, yes, clearly I am ex-military, but, but I, you know, I know a lot of people, some fantastic, fantastic operators out there, but they're here. Or, or, or in Australia, so that people are fantastic. I had the privilege to work with you who were not military, but absolutely shared the same values mm. and thoughts as I do. Look, the point, let, let, let me just make clear what I'm saying. Uh, if you, you are in the fire and rescue service, surely you are joining the fire and rescue service to serve people. Surely that's got yeah. to be your motivation for joining. And therefore, surely, surely you would want to do that to the very best of of. of, of of your own individual ability and the collective ability of the team, surely. And if you do, if that's not what you're there for, then what? What? That's my. That's it's a rhetorical question. No, then surely that. Yeah. What are you doing? What, what? What is it you're here for? Then you know, if it is not that, mm-hmm. it's like any other public. Mm-hmm. You would. I would expect that people were in policing for similar reasons. Or, yeah. Or the ambulance service. So and if you excuse the pun, if we had a, a greater emphasis on a high level of training, a high level of performance, that would fan the flame, if you excuse the pun, of people's desire to be a great competent operator, to serve their community, and to be very good professional firefighter. If we had a if we had a greater focus on the level of training and level of um, competency of, of operators out there. I, look, I agree, and and that is. For the time I was a chief officer, that's very much what I tried to. It is for others to judge whether I was successful at that. You know, I I, I'm in touch with many of the people that I I served with in in, in Melbourne. You know, you you've interviewed one yeah. of the people. I, I got J- Jared Mann. You might recall, absolutely yes, Gerard. Yeah, I speak to him regularly. Yeah, you know, he he. he 
you know, really good example of someone who's just absolutely committed, passionate, you know, much like yourself. Completely. He's getting himself out there, bless him. I was, uh, I see he's at another uh, high rise conference next April, I think it is. He's, uh, yeah, he is, um, he, he is indeed, yeah. But uh, you know, he and I, we, we, we speak often, and, and many of the other people that, that I work with, fantastic, fantastic people, yeah. and you know, just, just really motivated to, to, to the, to the developments and the, the, the betterment of our, of our service. You know, I, d- I just feel to me like. And I say, culture stuff. Absolutely, no one can. It, it fundamentally important, and 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 no one, no one's suggesting to the contrary. But I do come back to say, ultimately, we are a fire and rescue service. That has to be the over. That it is that delivery of, of of. We need to be good at what we do. Like I said, I think in the technical rescue space, I think we're, I think we're really good. I think we're. There's been lots of good developments, as I say, the likes of Ukro and people that do fantastic, fantastic yeah. work. You know, the Institute of Tech Rescue and such like, really, really good stuff. A lot of good hazmat stuff, you know, some really good multi-agency <laughs> stuff going on out there. I just think the one area where we are some way behind now is in respect yeah. of actually our core business is the firefighting piece. And, but there yeah. is a load of reasons. resting on our laws. Yeah, well, it, it, it. I mean, nothing shifted since '94, and you know that the quote that you 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 gave earlier that was from a, a report from a, a guy called Lee Johnson, who was who was a, a senior officer in West Sussex Fire. And I've got to say, it's, for me, it's probably the best articulation I've ever read. Of you know, really, really switched on guy, totally new stuff, and you know, tried a great deal to 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 advance things. With his sole motivation, much like mine, it's just, you know, I, I one anecdote for you, I guess, as a, as a personal anecdote on the the evening that, that Stephen Hunt lost his life in, in Greater Manchester, I was duty principal officer in the Merseyside. I'm going to say it was probably about nine o'clock that night. I get to call off the Merseyside fire control to say that the, the duty principal officer, I think it was Jeff Harris at the time, in Greater Manchester needs to speak to you. My heart sank, Pete. There could only be one reason that he wanted to speak to me. And I, I already knew what it was. That they, they've lost someone at the job. Sure enough, that's what it was. And it was just a never, ever in my life, never again do I want to you know, just get a phone call like that. I was deployed to Atherston. It, 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 it ended up the USAR. Atherston on store. Yeah. To do the body recovery. We were the messy side with it. We did one night shift there. So and I discovered located the, one of the, the initial um, first firefighters with a, a crew from Hampshire, I'm going to say from memory. Horrific. Absolutely horrific. Yeah. Never, never again. I would do anything, yeah. anything I could to, to avoid that ever, something like that ever happening again. That's my fear. If we if we don't circle back and, and sort of recalibrate our focus on some of these things, uh, these tragedies will become more frequent and more often for a few contributing factors, not only everything you've articulated there, but also the aspect that we're going through a tremendous amount of retirement now. There's a colossal amount of experience being lost and we're hemorrhaging it from the UK Fire and Rescue Services. As many people go into uh, a very well-earned retirement or moving into different careers, we're doing so much recruitment. We're doing so much training of, of brand new firefighter development so that's why I wanted to have someone such as yourself on. Uh, and I really hope you come back, to be honest, because I found so much value from our conversation today. Because creating a backing track uh, for people to focus on things like this, I think is crucially important for us not to lose sight of the core purpose of why we exist. Absolutely, Pete. Amen to that. Is there any closing things you would like us to circle back to? I can edit this a little bit out, but is there anything... I'm looking over my list of notes... I think we've actually done a fantastic job of covering so much there. Is there anything uh, you'd like us to circle back to before we look at closing? Listen, I, I could talk forever, mate, on this stuff. So I think... Hey, I'd love to have you back. It's been a real privilege. We've spoken for nearly two hours there and I feel like we could go for another four. Yeah. But uh, I want to be respectful of your time. No, I'm, I'm. listen, I'm all good. Hopefully, was that okay? Did that give you something to work with? Uh, we went in so many fantastic directions there, mate. You're an absolute cornucopia of knowledge. Um, and I genuinely know bullshit because we don't have to say this at the end of episodes. I would really love to, after we've recorded this and it comes out 
probably January uh, or early Feb because we've got about 32 episodes currently recorded. But I love once you've had a listen to it because um, you'll do what everyone does is you'll go, oh, I don't believe, I can't believe we didn't talk about this. We didn't talk about that. Actually, I'd love to expand on this or given what we spoke about. So maybe having a conversation again in March or April of next year would be great if you found it a positive experience. Yeah, for sure. But look, if it, 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 you're doing great stuff here. Anything, uh, we clearly we, we clearly occupy the same space, mate. We're clearly, we're clearly in it for the same. Well, I'm an eternal student. You, we're occupying the same space, but you're several leagues ahead of me i'm just trying to shortcut the system and make this accessible to people before they are 30 years deep realizing they didn't know a lot of this stuff do you know what we didn't speak about critical incident decision making and running big jobs or running jobs period maybe that's one for us to come back to we'll we'll do it on a we'll do it on a separate date okay dan thanks so much for your time today mate i really really appreciate it and i sincerely look forward to having you on again brother thanks very much for having me peace it's been a pleasure the firefighters podcast was created to recognize acknowledge inspire and hopefully even motivate these incredible individuals who have chosen to be part of the first responder community and driving purpose is to create a legacy resource for the current and future generations of firefighters and first responders we get some incredible feedback from listeners and guests and as the podcast grows our desire to create longevity and sustainability means that we are asking for the support of our listeners if you want to support the podcast if you want to get discounts to our merchandise hoodies clothing coins patches t- and also access to all of the incredible documents get shared with us from our podcast guests and sector leaders and please head over to our patreon page and for just three pound a month you can support the future of the podcast please finally hit that follow subscribe or rate button on the platform you're listening and wherever you're in the world please support your emergency services responders and thank you for listening